Okay, you guys, let me just offer up a word of prayer and then um, we'll get started. I've got a lot to go over, and so I'm really sorry. I'm going to try to get through it. We need some time for some Q&A, okay? Um, thanks for coming in and making yourselves comfortable-ish. <laughs> um, so let's take a moment and pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to be here and to gather together. Um, thanks for, for all the work that, that the university puts into this, for Robbie and for Jack and others that are, that are spending a lot of time organizing this, Mary Darling. Um, Lord, we pray that um, today that, that you can continue to work in our lives and to teach us more about uh, vocation and work and the joy that we find in it. And so um, we just pray that you'd be with us, that, that I can somehow get through this and articulate it in a clear way that will help students understand a little bit more about how tenuous um, work looks like in terms of the garment industry in Cambodia. And so um, I thank you for this day and, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. We just, we just pray that this would honor and glorify you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, um, so let me get started, you guys. Um, you know the title already, so I'm gonna move through this. Uh, I, was, I was planning on doing something a little bit more dissertation related. But then we got, you know, leading up to, and we got in Cambodia, plans quickly changed because this was sort of like half of what we were doing was learning about the situation and what it looked like and, and stuff like that. So I'm gonna explain a little bit more about this. Um, this was sort of a reflection of a lot of the stuff that we learned this January. Um, also on sort of what we learned historically about the situation in Cambodia as well. Um, what I'm gonna try to do, this is, the title of the focus series, Finding Joy in What We Do. We're going to try to find some joy with this, um, but it's, it's, diff it's difficult because there's a lot of power dynamics going on and there's a lot of violence as well that, that makes it really difficult on all of the different actors that we'll talk about in terms of, of this presentation. Um, I'll start with a timeline of events. Now it's going to be abbreviated in the sense that like I'm going to start with sort of how things began over the summer, I'm going to sort of leave a gap, and I'm going to fill you in on what's happened lately. Um, so it'll be a timeline, but it's, it's an imperfect timeline because we don't have enough time to go over this completely. Um, then we'll talk about the different actors that are involved in sort of their stakes in some of this. And then we'll talk about moving forward, not only like where is Cambodia now, where is it sort of headed, but also a little bit more about, okay, what can we do um, you know, as college students, as, as individuals, to, to learn more about this and sort of, um, you know, make certain decisions in terms of what we, we buy and things like that. Um, this is Cambodia. Um, this is an imperfect sort of, should be shifted up here. It looked great on my PowerPoint. I'm really sorry. Um, but what you need to know particularly, right, so you've got Thailand, Laos, Vietnam. This is Southeast Asia. China's north. You know, India's over here. Um, this is the capital city, Phnom Penh, and that's where um, we saw, we, we spend a lot of our time when we go on the cross-cultural trip, but also over here in Kampong Spu, which is um, one of the areas where a lot of the garment industries are sort of concentrated, although it's, it's not just there, but it's around Phnom Penh and stuff like that. I could talk forever about maps, those of you guys who have been in my classes, I'm sorry, you probably know that already. Timeline of events in Cambodia. Um, this is just sort of like a historical sort of step-by-step -step here. July 19th, um, an opposition leader, Sam Ramsey, from the CNRP, so there's two major parties, okay? There's the CPP, Cambodian People's Party, and there's the CNRP, Cambodian National Rescue Party, okay? Um, Ramsey returns from France. It was sort of a self-imposed exile, but it was self-imposed so that they couldn't charge him and throw him in prison. Okay, so he leaves, he has dual citizenship, so he can do that, right? So he has French and, and Cambodian citizenship, so he can, he can flee. Um, he came back on July 19th because of the upcoming elections. Um, and on July 22nd, all of the, the election officials that run the elections are CPP, which is the, the party that's been in power for a long time. They reject his candidacy for prime minister, um, even though he had been pardoned of some of these charges only weeks before, and so they won't let him run. Um, July 25th, CPP again rejects his sort of his appeal for reinstatement as a legislator, not only in the National Assembly, but also to run as a candidate. And on July 28th, um, CPP claims victory with 90, or excuse me, 90, 
68 out of 123 parliamentary um, seats. The popular vote also elects Hun Sen, okay, which is the CPP leader, um, Hun Sen, as the prime minister by approximately a 55 to 45 vote, which means a pro he won approximately 55% of the votes. The, the um, Ranzi, who's the CNRP, won approximately 45. That's the closest the election's ever been. Okay? So what we see over the years, five year terms, is that the elections are becoming closer and closer and closer and closer, okay? Um, which is a threat to consent's power because in 2015 he will have been in power for like 30 years, okay? Um, yeah, we, that's, we touched on that. CNRP calls for an independent probe of election results, meaning the CNRP appeals to the UN and international bodies to say, okay, can we conduct an investigation into the elections in terms of like, were these, you know, we know that all of the election officials are CPP. How do we sort of, how can we sort of do this investigation to see if this was a, you know, the terminology is free and fair election, okay? Free and fair election. Um, July 31st, Ramsey states that CNRP won 63 out of 123 and that CPP, the CPP quote unquote, stole victory. So he's alleging based on the CNRP's investigation. So then it becomes a he's, you know, a back and forth like tit for tat kind of thing. Um, August 5th, 2013, he then he appeals again to the UN. And August 9th, the troops and APCs, or um, armored personnel carriers, if my military terminology is correct, and I see Mark Muller nodding at me, so I'm gonna trust that it is. Um, so they're deployed around Phnom Penh in a response to, to the threat to launch nationwide protests. So the CNRP says, okay, we're gonna protest these results. The CPP responds and says, okay, we're going to deploy the military to sort of keep law and order or to, to make sure that there's security, okay? Um, September 4th, Ramsey appeals to King Siamoni. So in Cambodia, like in many developing countries, you've got this traditional system of ruling, which is sort of like um, um, the, the monarchy, right? But you've also got the Western implemented model, which is... Um, which is the prime minister and the parliament and all of those things, okay? And so where a lot of people, a lot of traditional Cambodians, they still, they, they revere the king, or it's, it's especially Siamoni's dad, dad, who was Sihanou, who passed away recently. Um, a lot of Cambodians revere him. And so appealing to the king is a good thing in a lot of ways because it allows a quote unquote, you know, impartial individual to get involved and to try to help mediate things. Right? And a lot of people still respect him, even over the prime minister. Okay? So his, his word goes a long way. September 8, election authorities confirm 68 to 55 vote for parliament. They confirm popular election results. And then in here, there's also the point where the opposition then, which is made up of a coalition of three different political parties, um, Sam Ramsey party, the Human Rights Party, and another party I can't remember, um, they, they're, they decide they're gonna boycott the parliament. So since the summertime, there's no active parliament, parliamentary body at all, okay? They boycotted and said, we're not going to do this unless we can do it under different conditions, okay? Um, okay, so in, on September 14th, there's negotiations. So there's these protests and then there's talks and then they end, and then there's talks, and there's protesting, and then there's talks, and then they end, and so on and so forth, right? On September 15th, um, violent clashes between authorities and protesters, about 20,000 protesters, leave one dead and, and many wounded. Um, and so this is the first time in this election cycle that there's um, serious violence in which people die or are critically, and, and are critically injured. Um, they again meet for talks because they've don't want violence, um, and they have peaceful negotiations, and then we're gonna sort of like, here's the gap, okay? There's a three month gap here, and you can go online and see the rest of these, these events, especially at this website right here. This is an organization that, that works on human rights in Cambodia. Now fast forward to December 15th, okay? This is around the time that, you know, there's final exams, okay? Um, at Spring Arbor, so we're sort of we're making that final push and we're trying to wrap everything up. 
And, you know, we had heard a little bit about these, these protests. We knew where the protests were going on and some of these things. Um, and we knew sort of, okay, we have to be careful about where we go because you don't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time with a cross-cultural group, all these types of things, right? Um, so December 15, 2013, CNRP hosts third mass protest. So there's been some protests in that gap. Mass election protests by Occupy Freedom Park. Now, Freedom Park is, is the only place that I'm aware of where people can go and, and assemble and, and, and sort of exercise their freedom to assemble. Does that make sense? So people can go and get together and, and sort of protest or rally or do whatever they want to do to raise awareness of certain things. Okay, it's actually very close to a couple of tourist places um, near Wat Phnom, which is, is, a, is a, a tourist place that's laden with history and culture and monkeys, which I hate. But anyway, they, and also, um, it's near the US Embassy. Okay, by the way, monkeys are not these nice little peaceful creatures. Okay, they're horrible, especially when tourists always feed them and they want your food. And I don't give up my mangoes very easily. So I've also, I've almost had some altercations with What's all? horrible things. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's one of the things we call each other too when you know very little camp, very little Khmer is um, big monkey. So anyway, um, <laughs> which is what Josh just said. So December 15, 2003, CNRP hosts third, okay, and they do it in Freedom Park and they occupy Freedom Park, meaning people start staying there, sleeping there, constructing like encampments and everything like that, okay? Um, December 22nd, 2013, CNRP hosts largest protest yet. And this is sort of, you know, we're getting in the tens of thousands, you know, 30, 40,000 people in the streets. Um, and so the protests are becoming heightened and heightened. And this is just before Christmas. I mean, I'm assuming you guys know that. Anyway, right before, it's not funny. So right before Christmas, um, this is starting to ramp up a little bit more, right? So you, you're, you're gaining a little bit more aware of this and we're trying to keep track of it, and you know, especially with the cross-cultural office. Okay, now this is, this is like the last one I promise, okay? For those of you guys who are just enamored with history. Right? Just, just you know, absorbing this with every pore in your being. But anyway, December 24th, New Year's, or, <laughs> Christmas Eve. <laughs> Making sure you follow me. Um, Labor Advisory Council decides to raise, so this is where, um, at some point here, there's, a, there's a, a political and a labor or economic shift, okay? Because one of the things that the opposition has been able to do is to mobilize um, resistance to some of the minimum wage laws, okay? So in Cambodia, in the fall, the minimum wage, and actually up until just in February, the minimum wage is $80 a month, okay? Um, which means, you know, um, in Cambodia, normally people work eight to 10 hour days, six days a week, okay? Now you can work more than that if you want overtime, but that's normally sort of the work week for garment industry, okay? Um, they went from 80, the, the Labor Advisory Council decides to raise the minimum wage from 80 to 95 in April 2014, effective April, okay? and outlined a plan to reach 160 by 2018, okay? So one of the demands, yeah, so we'll, we'll get into this. So Christmas Day, and then the day after Christmas, representatives from six major labor federations, okay? And I don't know that I can name all of them, but I can name most of them. Garments, um, shoe, which is footwear, yeah. So, um, <laughs> teachers, transport, and there's two others. Okay. These representatives meet and they and they reject the plan to move to 95 and call for a raise to 160. Okay. Now they say 160 because they've done studies that say that in order for these workers to get by, they need to have 100. They need to make 160 dollars a month. Okay. That's at least the research that's been done by the Labor Advisory Council finds this, okay? Um, December 27th, CNRP backs workers' demands, visits them. So there's this eventual merger between the opposition political party, the CNRP, and the garment workers who are becoming increasingly disgruntled and so on and so forth. To give you guys an idea, the garment industry is the largest, is, is the single largest employer 
and revenue generator in all of Cambodia. So this is like the major industry within Cambodia, okay? Um, and so you've got about 600,000 people. It's a, I think it's like a $5 billion a year industry, okay? Now, when we talk about $5 billion, we don't mean that five, the, the $5 billion goes back into Cambodia, okay? But it employs a lot of people, okay? Um, December 29th, I believe, was a, the Sunday before we flew out, okay? Pictures start showing up, you know, upwards of 100,000 people in the streets in Phnom Penh. And by that time, I'm like, okay, 100,000 people, bless you. What's going on, okay? Um, 100,000, maybe the six figures gets my attention. I don't know what it is. So we're talking, you know, going back and forth, talking about it. We're trying to do as much research as we can um, during the time of the year that we normally get a break, okay? Um, so we're trying to learn as, as best we can. Um, and in, so as a result of these protests then, the MOL, which is the Ministry of Labor and Vocational Activities or something like that, decides to raise wages to $100 a month and to make them effective in February. So the government starts giving a bit more, okay? The workers and the unions talk about it and they decide that they, they still want to negotiate for the one, well, the union leaders decide they want to negotiate for the 160. So they reject the 100, okay? They reject the 100. Um, and this is the last night we stayed in our homes. So we flew, we were, we were over at the, the hotel the first, flew out the second, okay? Um, and so on the way in between flights, we're picking up some of these things as we're going, okay? Because granted, the, the, the red flag for us not to take a trip is State Department travel warning, okay? State Department travel warning, right? Because we know in a lot of the developing world countries, you have unrest, you have people that protest and want to do, you know, they want better living conditions and stuff like that. And so for us, when we, as we talked to the context we had on the ground, we felt like it was stable enough to be able to be there and was safe enough to be able to be there, okay? So January 2nd, you have protests throughout Phnom Penh, but they're more, they're more sort of centered or localized around the Ministry of Labor and around certain garment factories, okay? And one of the things that, that happened, and I'll show you a video in just, in just a minute, um, which by the way, some of it is graphic, so I just wanna throw that out there. Um, but, but what we saw was actually at that point, the government took action, and it was sort of encouraged um, um, by the, the, the government of South Korea, Chinese government, the US it's unclear, um, but, but is encouraged by those different Back those different um, governments to deploy troops and to sort of instead of doing sort of the sort of the control kind of stuff, um, it, it starts to get more violent. Okay, and this is literally when we're in the air. Okay, um, so there's mixed security forces. There's three major forces that we we see. You've got riot police, okay, in the RCAF, and they've got the shields and all this kind of stuff. Um, they're decked out in military fatigues. They're armed fairly heavily. Um, you've also got these, these civilian folks that, uh, as I'm reading about labor history in the United States, I'm learning that it's not uncommon in, in times where there were strikes for, for police and other law enforcement to deputize people to make them police to help put down strikes, okay? So these guys that you will see in the video, they've got red, red armbands. There's civilians that are sort of conscripted into the police force. And then you've also got this 9-11 force, which I'm sure was sort of funded as a result of the, the sort of the repercussions of 9-11. So how can countries respond to quote unquote acts or threats of terrorism? And so in some countries, believe it or not, protests and strike activity is viewed as terrorism, right? Um, in the sense that it's a threat to national security which is viewed as terrorism. And sometimes that's defined a little bit differently. Um, but it allows these countries to get funding to train these forces, okay? Which are there to protect national security, but they're also there to protect the interests of the powerful, 
And so that's what I want to sort of tease out a little bit. There's this difficult dynamic between what's you know, national security and what's protecting the interests of those who own the factories and manage the factories and so on and so forth, okay? Because that's a very difficult dynamic. Um, in this, in Beng Srang district, which is actually north, uh, no, sorry, south, west, and east of the airport, okay? Um, the, 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 the military actually opened fire on protesters there, okay? Now I want to show you some video, and it's going to show you a little bit about what happens on the second, the third, and the fourth, okay? Because there's three different days where some of this stuff happens. And it's it weird because we visited the industrial park where this happened two years previously. We actually got into a garment factory for the first time ever. And it was the same one that you had a lot of this stuff going on at. And then on January 4th, they disassemble all the encampments and start beating people that are there. And there's actually, at this point, there's a, there's a threat. Um, the CNRP leaders, there's a hit put out on them. So they go from Freedom Park right across the street to the U.S. Embassy and take refuge at the U.S. Assembly, the US Embassy so that they're not killed. Does that make sense? And this is... We know this is true because we had some people that were fairly well entrenched in the opposition movement. And we also know this is true because that's what Hun Sen's done in the past, right? He takes out opposition. So we, we knew a little bit of this. Let me show this video, you guys. It is graphic in some parts, so um, I'm just letting you guys know. Um, and I'm not good with technology, so please be patient with me. Uh, I just put it all the way to the end. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> this is it's still at the end. Well, what? I got this under control. All right. So this is going to be start with January 2. <laughs>
garment workers live that come from the countryside. They go to the You can go to the city. This is right by Green. This means a lot of monks and others. This is Green Park. These are the Chinese helicopters. <laughs> guys and let me try to transition back to this so Freedom Park after that you had heavy heavy military presence in Freedom Park and actually the day after that happens um, we actually stayed in for a part of the day because we weren't sure there were rumors that there would be protests and stuff like that and we didn't want to go out if there were protests because we didn't know what activity the military would take Right, so we stayed in for part of the day, but it was very sort of calm and low key. Now, that morning, um, one of the things that if I, you know, if I, if I, you know, stop teaching at some point, that I'll probably do is uh, take on a, a, you know, a job as a moto driver. <laughs> um, those things are awesome riding around in, in the city. Anyway, so, so Lloyd and I, you know, Dr. Chi and I, you know, we cruised around the city with with a couple of the the, the Cambodian nationals just to see what it looked like. And what you saw was like heavy police and, and military presence at a lot of the major um, areas. So Freedom Park, you had military all over Freedom Park. Okay? Again, trying to keep order, but also at the same time suppress any sort of resistance. So where's the, the balance with that? Right? Um, how do you sort of keep a, a balance? Now, next what I want to do is I want to go through the actors involved, and I'm going to start with the Cambodian government, then do the private sector and then talk about the protesters and the unions and the CNRP. Um, the Cambodian government, I mentioned this already, um, in 2015 Hun Sen will be in, um, in power for about, about 30, it'll be 30 years. Um, there's a patronage model in Cambodia and so what that means is that, is that those who are in power often give some of those, um, some of the prime positions near them to those who they know extremely well and who also will, will sort of pay this, this patronage to them. And so it becomes about who you know and, and stuff like that. And I mean, one of the things, you know, a couple quick examples. We were at, a, we were, we were at a, a place in the north where we were going to a little museum shop. And we talked to somebody and said, you know, how many, you know, what, did you have to go to school to, to be this tour guide? Oh, no, no, I didn't have to go to school. Um, like, so how did, how did you learn how to be a tour guide? Well we had to come up with enough money to pay the leader of the tour guides so that I could be one, right? Another example, and this is a kind of a funny one, but like 
Um, Philemon, who's like, you know, he's like our primary contact, and you know, he's he's terrific. He he was a, you know, he goes to he went to high school, and and Philemon, when we went to high school, he had an English teacher in his class in high school. And when we went to visit the high school, we went and talked to this English teacher, and Diane Kurtz, who's the the head of CCS over there, started talking to him and talked to him, and then anyway, on the on the bus ride home, she said, Philemon. I was talking to your English teacher. Why didn't he talk back to me? And finally, even said, "Because he doesn't speak English." <laughs> so it's not necessarily based on who you know. Or that's not, it is based on who you know. It's not necessarily based on achievement, but it's based on who you know and, and who you're able to sort of help support. We look at this as corruption and bribes in, in the U.S. In Cambodia, you don't. That's that's the way the system works. Okay, and so learning the, the system is, is key. So Hun Sen, his son is head of the security forces and he's West Point trained, okay? So a lot of these, these folks that, that are in these, these positions are trained in the West, you guys. I mean, they're trained in sort of the best military education programs in the world and those are here, okay? Um, but anyway, so Hun Sen's son is head of the security forces so it's not, you know, they speculate, but it wouldn't be necessarily unlikely for him to, you know, to be able to, to take power one day as well, and for Hun to, to hand over power to him, um, which just makes it, you know, more and more difficult over time. He's been accused of complicity in illegal logging. This is one of the funny stories I like to tell that the Cambodians told me, and that I like to tell is, is that Cambodia, you know, Steve Fitch came with the Free Methodist Church, talked about illegal logging and how that's very much a social issue or deforestation. How much is, it's, it's very much a so, so social issue, just like anything else that's connected to these things. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Cambodia is Cambodia is, is being deforested at the most rapid rate of any country on the face of the earth. Okay? And a lot of that has to do with Hun Sen allowing the military to go and log and then sell it, the, sell it the, the, the logs or trees or wood, whatever. To the, to the Chinese and then they're making money, the military's making money and he's taking care of the military because if he doesn't take care of the military, then guess what? The military's gonna take care of him and somebody else will be in power, okay? So one of the things that, that came out, and this, the, the Cambodians were laughing when they told me the story, but they said, they said Hun Sen, the Prime Minister, sorry, His Excellency Hun Sen, the Prime Minister, will come on television, right? And he came on television and he said, he said, I hear your complaints about the logging. I hear them. I understand them, and, and trust me, if this illegal, just as this illegal logging happens, if it continues, okay, just as they chop the tree, I will chop my head. That's what he says, like on television, right? If they continue to log, then I'll chop my head up, just like they log the trees. You guys get it? Man, it's late, it's right after lunch, I don't know. But, so then, the logging continues, right? Like it's not going to stop, it's profitable, it's fostering this relationship with the Chinese, he's keeping the military happy, he's staying in power because the military is happy, right? So, so it keeps going on, keeps going on, keeps going on. So then one of the things that they said and the jokes that they told was, well, Mr. Prime Minister, this logging, it continues to happen. They continue to take our trees away and our, you know, our forests are gone, but your head, it, why is it still attached? <laughs> you know? Why is your head still there? Because he said. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway. Okay, so the other, other factors. Garment industry is the largest employment sector in Cambodia. So the government has an interest in keeping the garment sector there because it employs the most people. Okay? Um, has Pat used force in the past and will use force to retain power. So these guys don't go down easily, okay? They don't relinquish power easily. He's tried over and over to, you know, get these, these term limits for eternity, okay? Has several mod modest residences throughout Cambodia, um, which we always joke about when we drive by. Um, <laughs> the last one, people perceive Hun Sen and others as Yon, which is a slang term for Vietnamese, okay? Now Hun Sen and Hun Sen fled during the Khmer Rouge time to Vietnam and then came back with the Vietnamese to, to overthrow the Khmer Rouge. And so a lot of people perceive Hun Sen as being very favorable to Vietnamese interests. And so they, they refer to him as Yon and they even call the soldiers Yon because they feel like they're enforcing, reinforcing a power dynamic 
which gives preference to outsiders as opposed to local people, okay? And so there's this, this term and, and stuff like that. Now the other aspect or the other sort of component to the, the government piece is the Ministry of, of Labor and Vocational Training. I, I told you about this study already, um, outlined a plan for growth over time, and they're also the subject and site of several protests by the opposition. And then the RCAF, we see a lot of these really nice vehicles driving around Phnom Penh. And it's not uncommon for those to have RCAF on the back of them, which means they're military, okay? And so um, it's difficult when you see a lot of the military folks, at least the higher ups, driving some of those nice vehicles, and everybody else is sort of living in a different, you know, much lower standard of living, right? Um, talked about this already. Yeah, there's also in, you know, um, you know, uh, Joel Brott and I would get in all these discussions about, you know, like, right to bear arms and weapons, all this kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm telling you, I had a really hard time in Cambodia because um, there is, you know, weapons are outlawed, and if you get caught with a weapon, you can get charged and thrown in jail. I tend to not be somebody that's overly excited about having a gun to make sure I'm okay. As you can tell, people don't mess with this. No. But the thing is, <laughs> That was a joke. Um, but the thing is, in case you were wondering, um, the, the thing is with, with the weaponry, I mean, how do, you, how do you have any sort of corresponding power with a government that controls the monopoly on violence if people aren't allowed to bear arms? What do people do, right? And so, yeah, not something I always like to admit, but, and I'll deny it if you ever, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, you, the, then the private sector, okay? A lot of these, these garment factories are, well, all of these garment factories, that are not all, majority, overwhelming majority, say 95 to 98% of garment factories are owned by, another con by, by an individual or a group of individuals in another country, okay? We talk about colonialism, transnational corporations, all these different dynamics. The difficult thing is, is, it's this whole, you know, um, how, did, how did our oil get under their sand phenomenon, right? Because it's very easy to go and set up shop in another part of the world and to extract resources and to profit off of those resources. But what happens with the people in, what happens to the people in the country? Do they benefit from the resources? If they do, to what extent? Okay, and this is sort of the resource curse, and this is, been written about a lot, particularly in terms of, of Nigeria, um, with the, the oil issue there. Um, over 400 factories, $5 billion industry, over 600,000 workers. Largest factories are surrounding Phnom Penh and, Scampo, and, and Kampong Spu. Um, $200 million in sales were lost. $70 million, $70. $70 million in revenue lost in the 50 days pre that, that violence, okay? So the garment industries are losing $200 million in sales, $70 million in revenues, and they, they claim their international orders were cut by, or could be cut by 20 to 30%. Because if you're a business, you want a country where the labor, is low, the labor um, regulations are lower, the, 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 uh, this is the race to the bottom, the wages are cheaper, and you want a country that's stable. That's why people like Hun Sen are in power, because they can bring stability, even though it's, it's with an iron fist, okay? And if it's stable, then that brings what? FDI or foreign direct investment, okay? If it's unstable, then people question the country and may want to extract their investments, which happens all the time, okay? Um, so they, they can pull their investment and send it somewhere else where there are more favorable working conditions, okay? Um, companies represent, these are some of them. Okay, H&M, Nike, Reebok, Adidas, Tommy Hilfiger, and there are others. In previous meetings with garment workers, they would actually hand us the tags from the companies that they were sewing these things for. They would say, these are the companies, okay? Um, and in the past, we were able to actually go and visit where they live, how they live, talk about how much they spend on everyday, everyday items, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, okay, this is the GMAC. They, their argument was that the military response was collateral damage. How can we possibly not respond this way when we're losing all of our money, okay? 
or when we're losing a great chunk of our profit. They lobbied along with the Korean government for a military response. In fact, there was a letter posted on Facebook from the Korean embassy to the Cambodian authorities, which later that day was taken down when there started to be these protests around um, um, government ministries in Seoul. Okay? And so there was very direct communication between the South Koreans and the Cambodians to protect their investments. Talk of the tipping point. So one of the things that GMAC would say is, well, at what point you know, do, you, do we pay you more and it becomes less profitable for us to be in Cambodia and more profitable for us to be in Bangladesh, which traditionally has been the country that pays the worst. Right? It's like at one point it was 11 cents an hour or something like that. Right? So this race to the bottom idea is that for businesses it's much more profitable to find the places where you can pay people less because when you can pay people less, you can make more money. The hard thing is though, is when you're employing these people in these places, like Bangladesh has had two or three large, large you know, um, factories burned down because the safety conditions and stuff like that weren't up to par. And so like, where's that balance, right? Um, tipping point, uh, appeal to workers to return to jobs. Don't follow those who upset law and order. Okay, so trying to pit them against others. And the RCAF military repression is justified in order to re restore law and order and national security. But when we hear about those things, I mean, in some ways they're true, but in other ways you're sort of thinking, well, yeah, but what about the rights and the conditions of the workers there? Like, you know, why aren't they making what they need to make in order to, you know, have a decent standard of living and take care of their families and their kids and stuff like that? Uh, average, average education level of a garment, industry, a garment worker in Cambodia is fifth grade, by the way. Okay, so a lot of these women will leave their families in the, the, the poor rural areas to work in the garment industries to make at least something that they can, so that they can send it home, okay? All right, uh, last actor involved, protesters, unions, slash CRP, okay? The role of the unions is a precarious one. Uh, several years ago, I went to a lecture in Michigan State that featured one of the union leaders. In fact, he's one of the vice presidents now, right? Uh, I think calm. He's, you know, it was so neat to hear my spoken in the United States. It was, it was really cool. And so I went up there and I learned about what they were doing. Then I, you know, I touched base with them. I said, hey, we come to Cambodia in, in January. Can we meet up with you? Can we hear more about what the union does? Can you show us where these workers live? I mean, we would sit down and have lunch with garment workers. We would go visit the neighborhoods where they lived. We could see their homes. How, get to ask them questions about how much they make, how much they have to pay for this, that, and the other thing. Would really sort of paint a good picture of it. This year we weren't able to because we had, there's a little bit more drama. But uh, the role of unions is a precarious one. So there's two types of unions in Cambodia. There's like private ones and there's government influence ones. The majority of unions in Cambodia are actually put in place by the CPP to outnumber the other unions. So whenever they get together as, as groups of unions and they vote, the, the, the government controlled unions outvote the private, the private unions. Does that make sense? So if they vote for a, a minimum wage increase, they get outvoted because the government doesn't want a minimum wage increase because that upsets the dynamic with the GMAC, because all these businesses agreed to come to Cambodia because they could pay workers less. Does that make sense? So as they up the, the, the ante or they up the, the wages, then that threatens the imbalance between the, the dynamic between the government and the, the GMAC. Um, they argue, so there's, I talked about the different sectors, they argue 160 is the starting point, but reject $100 a month. When I think about it, you go from 80 to 100, I'm like, that's a 25% increase, okay? That's pretty stinking good. Like I know there's a couple of us in here that wouldn't mind a 25% increase, right? Um, some of you guys that you work your student jobs on campus or off campus probably wouldn't mind a 25% increase. The problem is when the government declared that it was gonna go to a $95 a month wage, immediately all of the tenants around those, in those encampments raised housing $5 a month, okay? So everybody else knows when you're getting the wage increase and how much it's gonna be so they can charge more too. Does that make sense? So everybody knows and then it, you know, the, other, the other costs move up too. For those of you guys who remember when we're going back into Phnom Penh from Kampo, or from Kaip in the south, 
we went by truckloads and truckloads and truckloads and truckloads, like hundreds, I mean, easily thousands of workers. So what about the guys that, that, that drive the trucks to take them back to where they live? Think they're gonna raise the, the, they're gonna raise the, the wages of transport? Of course they are, right? Or the cost of transport, sure, okay? And so the difficult thing here too is um, the relationships with politicians is uncertain. So how do you know like, how do you know how close the CNRP, what if Hun Sen goes to Ramsey and says, okay, listen, politically, here's what we can do, but we're not gonna touch the wages. What does he say? Does he take the deal? It benefits him. Okay, and so where are those sort of those political gaps or inconsistencies there? Role of the CNRP, three major figureheads, Sam Ramsey, M. Soka, and Mosokua. Um, they are sort of the, the ones that are out there um, that are sort of the, the, the lead politicians in the coalition. Um, they ultimately want regime change. So what they ultimately want, I think, is, is either regime change in order for Hun Sen to step down or they want a government that's based on power sharing and not sort of just this monopoly of power by the CPP, okay? Um, where do workers' rights fit into the equation and what is the solution moving forward? And so I'm gonna sort of head into this and then I wanna leave some time for questions. I'm so sorry, because I this is taking way too long here. Current state of Cambodia, in a nutshell, is that this is still, we're still seeing cycles. Negotiation, more tension, negotiation, more tension. The word that I'm getting is that they're um, remobilizing for more, more protests than they had before, okay? Mm -hmm. To put power on the government, to pay workers more, and to sort of concede to like a, a more of a sort of um, equal power sharing arrangement within the government. Um, but at the same time, there's that whole idea of a tipping point. How high can wages go before those, go those, those businesses will leave Cambodia? And then what do the workers do? The businesses leave Cambodia. Then what do they do? They may not have jobs at all, okay? And for, for young women primarily who only have a fifth grade education, that's a difficult thing, okay? That's a real difficult thing. Um, what can we do? So this is sort of like a continuum of things. Like if you guys want something to take away from this, what can you do? I think the first thing you can do is, is to remember to pray for Cambodia. Pray for the political situation there. Pray for what God's will is there. You know, I know that, you know, we talk about, oh, pray, you know, but, but I think prayer needs to undergird whatever it is that you do, whether it's with regard to Cambodia or Japan or whatever country that, that you learn more about or that you visit or that you know people. I mean, it's like you've got to be able to sort of um, bathe this in prayer. Raise awareness about the issues. Talk to other people about it. Tell them about what's going on, what some of these issues are. And then this is the big step for me. Is, I mean, this is what I feel like is most important for me in the work that I do here, specifically with regard to some of these issues that we get involved in, is to go beyond awareness and beyond this, oh, this is so horrible, you know, I, you just got to stop this, to like, what is it we're actually talking about here? Because these issues aren't easy. I mean, it's not just, this is good, this is bad. I mean, there's a lot of gray, and it's a continuum. So what can we do? to learn more about these issues so that we can understand the dynamics involved and, and advocate in ways that, that, that line up consistently with our faith perspective and that respect the rights and humanity of, of other people, okay? And I think that's huge. So to me, this is research, okay? I always tell students, listen, okay, these papers aren't just something that are, you should agonize over. Whatever the Lord's called you to do or whatever you feel like he's called you to do, like, Start working on stuff. I mean, start writing papers on these topics. Start doing research on these topics. Look for internships. Look for other opportunities to work with people who are out there in the field doing the work now, okay? Get involved. Make this, make your college experience useful and worth something. Worth something. I would hate to think that four years later you're gonna look back and be like, what was this for? Where did it get me, okay? Um, learn how to practice sustainable consumption habits. So what does this mean? This means, in a nutshell, because I put a lot of stuff here, what does this mean? It means learn where your money goes, okay? Learn what you're supporting and what you're not supporting, okay? And, then, and this takes time, guys. You're not gonna be able to do this tomorrow, okay? But learn about you know, where the, the food comes from that you buy, 
right? Um, who picks it or who harvests it? I mean, learn about the clothes that you buy, okay? Who makes them? Are they getting paid a sustainable wage? There are clothing companies and manufacturers that produce clothes and other things that you need where they, they do a lot better job than other companies do. So do research. Some people, some people raise their hand and be like, just tell me, Norwood. I'm like, no, because long-term you know, consumer behavior changes, not with me telling you, but with you doing the research and finding out on your own, and then in, you know, implementing these things into your life, okay? Um, and then the last thing, you guys, just if you, you want to learn more, you're interested in Cambodia, market day is tomorrow, okay? 11 to 1.30 in the Ralph Carey Forum. If you guys are interested in Cambodia or any of the other really great cross-cultural experiences that we have, that's tomorrow, RCF, 11 to 1.30. Um, and then I want to, I'm not going to, I don't want to let people go, even though if you guys feel like, oh my gosh, I really need to go right now, because I'm so close, I don't know. But like, if you guys want to ask questions, then I'm, I'm, I'm fine answering some questions. I've got till about 2.30, so if you guys, if you guys want to raise your hands and ask questions, I can sort of take a few questions now, and then when it's 2.15, dismiss you, and then other people want to hang out and talk, that's fine. So do you guys have any questions right now about this? Something, I'm sure some of you people that have been to Cambodia have questions and I missed some things, so, yeah. Um, would it actually do any good for them to raise wages if like everybody else raises their prices too? Yeah. Or um, I think it depends. I think we'd have to look at, um, because what we see not only in Cambodia, but also in the United States, okay, is you see wages that become very stagnant while other cost of living, you know, cost of, of living factors go up. So, you know, wages stay consistent or they actually drop when housing goes up, you know, transportation goes up, food costs go up, and all these types of things. And so, I think, you know, what we've got to sort of work toward is, is not necessarily that people make the, the, you know, as much money as they possibly can you know, i.e. certain unions in the U.S. over the years, right? But how do you make a sustainable living wage um, while also sort of controlling for some of those other factors? And I think sustainability, moving toward a more sustainable future is part of that. Um, how do we negate some of those increases becomes difficult, right? Um, but as we've seen with the housing market, it can't just keep going up. It has to stabilize over time, right? Um, Emily? I was just curious if like the United States had regulations about when we raise our minimum wage, if things around can that also be raised as well? Um, I don't think there's necessarily regulations in terms of those types of things, sort of like price controls or stuff like that. I don't think that we see that here. Um, because yeah. I know Michigan's talking about raising our minimum yeah. wage and I didn't know if there was anything to regulate other things from like if you get the raise in your minimum wage then does that just mean that everything else is going to go up as a result of that i think it'll be interesting to see i don't want to tell you what i think will happen because it might make you feel sad <laughs> i don't know that cambodia is so much different in that sense right and i think the other thing that we have to think about with some of this stuff you guys when we look we talk about sustainable consumption habits and this was Part of a talk that Jim Martin gave, and that actually somebody else was part of over in Marshall a couple weekends ago, but was like, how many times like, do we go and buy things on sale and be like, oh, we just saved all this money, but then where does the money you saved come from? Like, who does that? Because it's not just like you can save money and everybody's taken care of, right? It's not like you go to the Chinese buffet and pay $2.50 for a buffet and it's like you got a great deal. They can give you that deal because they're not paying people. They're not paying people a lot, right? So what are some of the ways in which we can purchase things that we know um, are moving toward that idea of sustainability? You know, um, for example, you know, for those of you guys who are business or business related, I mean majors. I mean, one of the things to think about is, you know, we visited this, this project north of Phnom Penh where they actually they had a, a garment factory, okay? And they employed women who used to be involved in the sex trade in this, this village where it was incre incredibly prevalent. And so, you know, I got all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, garment industry, 
Christian NGO, I got all my set of questions already. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just as critical on them as I am on anybody else, right? I'm like, okay, you know, I talked to this guy who I saw two years ago. I'm like, hey, we met a couple years ago, you know? He's like, yeah, I think I remember you. And I'm like, so, you know, so we talked a little bit about the operations, bless you. And I said, so I gotta ask you, you know, you know this question's coming, like how much do you pay people, mm -hmm. right? He said, we pay people at least two times the normal minimum wage. I said, okay, great. You pay people better, okay? That's, I think that's terrific. How, so then what's the question? The question is, how much do you charge for your product? And he said, we're able to tap into markets in the United States where people will pay more because they know their money is going to a cause that supports these women, okay? So the question is like, not only how can you pay people more in some of these circumstances and how do you control all those other factors, but how do we also get out of this mentality where we've got to save on absolutely everything and that, you know, in some ways we sort of like get, we sort of like extract value from how much we save on things, right? It's like, oh, you know, I saved all this money. You know, we feel really good about ourselves. But like, are we thinking about the entire equation when we talk about buying from, you know, fair trade or Whole Foods or all these other sort of options, you know, um, some of those options that, that might be better um, in terms of how we're stewarding the resources God's given us, right? I mean, I don't, you know, see anywhere in the Bible where God's like, yeah, go find that sale, baby, right? But it's more about how do we get the resources that we have and how do we utilize those in a way that we can also create futures for other people to flourish, not just ourselves, okay? In fact, I think the sale thing is often very self-centered and very Americanized in a lot of ways, which, I mean, try going to a developing country and going to a supermarket and then coming here and going to a supermarket. It just blows your mind. Like, why do we, I mean, I'll have a mini mental breakdown sometimes. It's like, why do we need all this stuff, right? Um, anyways, I'm sorry. Go off on these rants. Any questions, you guys? Anything last minute you want to ask? James? Uh, so, is there any ability for the, like, the protesters and strikes or whatever to be dealing with the actual companies opposed to the government? Because, like, typically when people have strikes or want pay raises, they're not dealing with the government. I mean, at least here in America, you'd be dealing with your actual company that's paying you. Yeah. Um, I think we saw this in the appeals to the international community, right? So, uh, so Kula goes on YouTube and does a YouTube clip and says, listen, consumers, understand that when you shop at these companies, this is what you're supporting, this violence, okay? So in order to keep the cost down of what you want, this is what has to happen, right? To keep control of people in these other parts of the world. Okay? And so she's trying, the, the opposition and the union leaders are trying to appeal to our sense of consumption in what we buy and what we support. Because if the consumers come out and say, listen, we're not gonna buy from you or we're not gonna support your company if this is the way you treat workers, right? Because what they're gonna listen to is profit market, mm -hmm. right? If, if, if people can sort of get behind that, then I think there's a different, aspect there. But I mean, you remember when we were there, they're trying to take petitions to the embassies and the military stopping them before they can even get to the embassy. Throwing them in the van, detaining them for a day, harassing them, and then letting them go again. So I think they can do those international appeals, right? But it's, it's not as easy. And they have to rely on technology and some of that stuff to do with you guys. So, yeah, Dakota? How do the CEOs of these big companies play in the picture? Yeah. So a lot of what we saw was when this stuff is going down, all these companies are coming out and releasing press releases and statements saying what? We don't support this violence. You know, the Cambodian government shouldn't be acting in this repressive way, so on and so forth. But when you look at supply chains of these companies, um, it's almost like what we find in other industries. Those who are at the top have no idea what's going on about those at the bottom. And if, and if they do, they've got some sort of plausible deniability where they can say, you know, because there, there's just, you know, um, uh, supplier after supplier after manufacturer and all these different layers of these businesses to the point where, like, you're going through several different businesses 
in order to sort of even make and, and construct and ship and market and sell the product. And so um, the CEOs and I think the companies are coming out and saying, we don't support this. But I, I just, I'm just like, okay, what does that mean? Like, so what are you gonna do? Like what, you know, how do you do that? And how do you argue that? But yet at the same time, you're so concerned about your bottom line that this sort of is what it entails, you know? So, yeah, John. Um, I, you guys can feel free to go, I'm sorry. Feel free to go, because it's um, after 2.15. I want to respect your time. So, what, what was the, I, I keep my name, Garment? Garment? Garment, yeah, the Garment, garment industry. Um, so, they're the, the largest supplier of jobs. Yeah, actually, why don't, just hold your question. Why don't we do this? Those of you guys who want to go, feel free. If you guys want to stay and do some more Q&A and discussion, then I'm fine with that too, but I just want to respect the people that are asking questions.